Hello. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, when the world was freezing cold and great big hairy elephants called mammoths wandered around in the snow, there lived a very sad man whose wife had just died. <coughs> a mammoth had fallen out of a tree and landed on her. And his neighbour was a large, strange woman who wasn't so much sad as bad. Her husband had also died, but he had been pushed under a mammoth. Some said by her, but no one could prove it. Anyway, both the man and the woman each had one daughter, and eventually they decided to get married. But although at first the woman seemed to love her new stepdaughter, that love soon turned to dislike, and the dislike soon turned into hate. The reason for this was simple. The man's daughter was beautiful and gentle and quite, quite perfect. But her daughter was cruel and ugly and smelly and just sat around the house all day picking her nose and saying, Ugh, look at the size of that one, everybody. And so the woman was eaten up with jealousy. So one day in the winter, when the snow lay thick on the ground and everything was as hard as stone, she took a dress which she had made out of paper and told the girl to put it on. Right, she said. Now, go outside into the swirling, freezing snow and don't come back until you've found me an enormous basket of strawberries. Yeah. <laughs> but stepmother, the girl protested, there are no strawberries in winter and this dress is far too thin. The thorns will tear it off and I'll freeze in the wind. Don't you dare answer back to me. The stepmother cried, and she produced a small lump of hard bread. Here, take this. Be a nice meal for you, won't it? Yeah, and it's better than you deserve. <laughs> yeah, come here. No, 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 come here, darling. Hello. <laughs> now get lost. Well, the girl had no choice but to obey. So off she went into the swirling snow. Oh. Into the swirling snow. <laughs> and she was looking for strawberries when there wasn't so much as a blade of grass in sight. Eventually, she came to a small house, and as she drew close, she saw three little men in the downstairs window. Eh, eh, uh. By now, her dress was in shreds and she was blue with cold. So she went and she uh, 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 tap, 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 knocked on the door. Come in, come in, come in, the three men cried. Come, come in, come in, come and sit by the nice warm stove. <laughs> well, the girl accepted their invitation gratefully, and as she'd eaten nothing all day, took out her little piece of bread and began to nibble at it. Oh, oh, oh yum, yum, oh, look, oh, stale bread. The three little men got very excited at the sight of it. Oh, yum, yum, oh, can we have some, please? Now... The poor girl had hardly any for herself. But because she was so good and kind, she didn't argue, but divided it into four. Oh, oh thank you, said the little men once they'd eaten it. Oh, that was yum <laughs> And uh, And now, if you don't mind, <laughs> would you mind going outside and sweeping up the snow at the back door? And once again, the girl did as she was told. And to her astonishment, underneath the snow, she found a basket full of ripe strawberries. <laughs> keep it, keep it, keep it, the three little men called out. And because you've been so kind to us, we have three presents for you. Mm. Every day you will grow more beautiful, the first little man said. Gold pieces will fall out of your mouth every time you talk, the second little man said. You will marry a king. The third little man said, you will, you will, you know. And after receiving these three gifts, the girl shook hands and went home. Well, the stepmother was astonished to see her, and her eyes widened as she heard the story, particularly as every time the girl opened her mouth, bleh, clang, a gold coin fell out. By the end of the story, bleh, clang, bleh, clang, there was so much gold in the room, bleh, clang, bleh, clang, bleh, 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 clang, 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 they could hardly move. Blimey! 
I've got to try this for myself! The stepmother exclaimed and yanked her own daughter off her comfortable seat by the fire. Out you go, she ordered. Oh, Mum! The daughter whined. Just be quiet. Here, put on this meat cake, darling. You won't be cold. And look, take this huge piece of chocolate cake. You won't be hungry. <laughs> now off you go and find those three short little men in the wood. <laughs> Touch off. <laughs> well, the girl went straight off and soon found her way to the little house. She was invited in, just like her stepsister, and sat down by the stove where she... <coughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and she sat down by the stove where she pulled out her enormous slice of chocolate cake. Ooh, chocolate cake, the three little men exclaimed. Oh, can we have that, please? Get lost, the girl replied. There's hardly enough here for me. And she promptly ate the lot. <laughs> Even though it made her feel rather sick. OK. You have warmed yourself at our fire, they said. Will you now sweep the snow at our back door? You're joking! <laughs> Do it yourself, you dirty little creeps. Oh, I see, the three little men said. You are cruel and selfish, and so these are the three gifts we will give you. Every day you shall grow a little uglier, the first little man said. Every time you speak, a toad shall spring out of your mouth, the second little man said. You shall die a miserable death, the third little man said. You will, you know. Well, the girl ran home to her mother, who was waiting at the door. Speak to me, she cackled, expecting a coin. Mum! The daughter wailed. <laughs> and a huge green slimy toad leapt out of her mouth. <laughs> and by the time she'd finished telling her story, <laughs> boing, boing, ribbit, 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 by the time she'd finished, the whole house was <laughs> ribbit, crawling with huge toads. In the weeks that followed, the daughter got uglier and uglier, while the stepdaughter got more and more beautiful, and the stepmother got crueler and crueler, determined that the beautiful girl should die. But there was still the third gift that the three little men had promised. And sure enough, one day, a king rode past, saw the beautiful girl on her knees beside the river, and carried her back to the palace to be his wife. So now the girl was rich and happy. She loved her husband, and soon she gave birth to a baby boy. But shortly after the birth, the horrible stepmother came to visit with her ugly daughter. They grabbed hold of the queen and threw her out of the window and 200 feet down into a pond. Then the ugly daughter got into bed instead of her and the mother pulled the sheets over her head. A short while later, the king came home. Uh, where's my wife? He demanded when he saw the stepmother waiting in the bedchamber. <laughs> oh, don't you worry about her, your uh, majesticness. <laughs> the woman replied, she's uh, just got a bit of flu, that's all. <laughs> you let her rest. <laughs> well, the king didn't suspect that anything was wrong, so he went over to the bed and said, uh, well, how are you, darling? Uh, hello. <laughs> and a horrible fat toad leapt out onto the pillow. <laughs> oh, don't worry about that, your majesticness. <laughs> the stepmother crooned, it's just the flu. <laughs> uh, it's nothing to worry about. <laughs> But the king was worried, and that night, as he sat alone in the throne room, a duck flew in out of the moonlight and came right up to the throne. Well, the king thought he must be dreaming, which was strange, because he hadn't gone to bed yet. The duck appeared with a sword, which it gave to the king. <coughs> Swing the sword three times over my head, <coughs> as I stand on the threshold of the castle, <coughs> and your wife will appear. <coughs> and the king did, as he was told. And a moment later, the duck flapped its wings and transformed into his wife, who stood there in front of him, alive and well, and more beautiful than ever. Well, as soon as she had told him what had happened, the king summoned the stepmother to the throne. OK, tell me, he said, what would you do to someone who had dragged an innocent woman out of bed and thrown her into a pond? Do? The stepmother thought for a moment. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what I'd do, your kingliness. I'd, I'd put them in a barrel. Bang a load of nails into it and roll them down a hill. <laughs> you have pronounced your own sentence, the king exclaimed. That's what I shall now do to you. Oh, no, um, wait a minute. No, I said the wrong thing, the stepmother said. <laughs> On second thoughts, I'll give her loads of cash, get her a big car, a couple of houses and... But it was too late. 
The stepmother and her horrible daughter were locked up together in a barrel, the top was hammered on, nails were banged in, and the whole thing was rolled down the steepest hill and over a cliff, and that was the end of them. <sighs> and at last, everybody in the kingdom could live happily ever after. And about time too. Now, what exactly do you mean by this pathetic behaviour? <laughs> Stop it, sit down, sit down, sit down. <laughs> Here's a good story. Once upon a time, there were two children who lived on the edge of a great forest with their father, a poor woodcutter, and their stepmother. And the children's names were Hansel and Gretel. But no matter how hard the woodcutter worked, there was never quite enough food to go around. And then, as if to make matters worse, a famine fell on the land. And one night, as they lay in bed, the stepmother turned to the father with the candlelight dancing in her pinched grey eyes. Listen, my dear, she said, we must do something. We've no food. <laughs> At least not enough for the four of us. We must get rid of Hansel and Gretel. But, my dear, the father replied, we can't do that. Not to our own children, can we? It's either them or us, my love, <laughs> she said. Listen, tomorrow we'll take them into the forest, right? We'll pretend that we have to collect firewood. <laughs> but we'll leave them there and we'll, we'll run off. <laughs> and they'll never find their way home. <laughs> well... The father wasn't happy. No, 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 he shook his head and he argued, but she was too strong for him. And in the end, he sank back under the bedclothes and agreed. Oh, well, all right then. Oh. <sighs> now, Hansel had been too hungry to sleep that night and he'd overheard everything that had been said. As soon as he was sure that his two parents were asleep, and the way his stepmother snored, that wasn't too hard to tell. <laughs> Horrible noise. He slipped out of the house, and in the light of a full moon, he collected as many pebbles as he could carry, each one glittering like a silver coin, and he filled his pockets with them, ready for the next day. The next day came, and off they all went, and as they walked, Hansel, secretly, dropped the pebbles on the ground to leave a trail behind him. Lots of tiny pebbles slipped silently onto the forest floor. Finally, they came to a small clearing and their father built a bonfire to keep them all warm. Then the stepmother put an arm round each of the children, smiled sweetly <laughs> and said, Well, why don't you two dear children just sit down here and have a rest by the fire, you know? No, 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 no. Don't even offer to help. <laughs> you just keep nice and warm by the fire. <laughs> don't worry, we'll just go and get some wood. We won't be long. <laughs> OK? Um, cheerio. <laughs> And with that, the wicked stepmother tore off at 50 miles an hour, dragging the father with her, and the children were lost and alone in the wood. But as soon as the moon had risen, the scattered pebbles shone like silver lights, and Hansel and Gretel followed them all the way home. Well, the stepmother was astonished. Hansel! Gretel! You're home! I mean, I mean, uh, you're home! <laughs> Where have you been? Worrying us to death! Batter, batter, batter! Punch, poke, punch! Smack, smack, batter, 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 batter! Punch, 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 etc., etc. For two whole hours. Anyway, a few weeks later, she decided to try again. Lying in bed, she forced her husband to agree to leave the children in the forest one more time! But once again, Hansel overheard them talking, and so was ready with a plan. The next day, off they went, this time, as they made their way into the wood, Hansel scattered crumbs from a piece of bread he had saved from breakfast on the ground to make a path back. Well, at the first opportunity, the stepmother <laughs> took off like a rocket and Hansel sat down with Gretel and waited for the moon to rise. But this time, things didn't work out as he had hoped. For the birds that lived in the wood had swooped down and eaten the crumbs and this time, the children were well and truly lost. Whichever way they turned, the forest seemed to block their way. 
Great briars and thistles sprang up like a wall. Muddy bogs and, and rivers bubbled hungrily in the ground. Pits and quarries opened up to pull them in. And all around them they heard strange sounds. The flap of wing and the beat of claw and the hiss and snarl of strange invisible things. Faster and faster they pushed their way forward through stinging nettles and branches until suddenly they burst through into a clearing and saw the most extraordinary house they'd ever seen. It was made of gingerbread. It had a, a candy-coated doorknob, sugar glass windows, licorice doorbells, a chocolate roof with turrets topped with an ice cream sauce. Dear Le Chasse. And just right for two lost hungry children. Well, Hansel tore off a piece of the roof and Gretel ripped away a big chunk of wall. And both of them were eating away when a soft, slimy voice came from inside. Guzzle, gobble, nibble, gnaw. Who's that eating at my door? Eh? There was a movement, and an old woman came out, dressed in rags, with sagging skin, yellow teeth, and eyes like wrinkled prunes. Her legs were all bent and twisted, like a spider that someone had accidentally stepped on, or more likely deliberately stamped on. Just looking at her made you feel horribly sick, especially after all those sweets. She was so short-sighted that she had to come right up. Right up two inches away from the children before she could see who it was. But when she saw... Hansel and Gretel, her face broke into a smile. Why, it's two delicious, um, I mean, um, delightful <laughs> little children, <laughs> she said. Why don't you come inside my little house? You know, no, don't be afraid. <laughs> I'd love to have you both for dinner. <laughs> the old woman, of course, was a witch. And she had deliberately built a house out of chocolates and sweets simply to attract children, because children were her favourite food. And sure enough, as soon as they were inside the house, she seized hold of Hansel and threw him into an iron cage and locked the door. <laughs> then she turned on Gretel. And now, my precious, <laughs> you can work for me. Get in the kitchen and cook something scrumptious for your brother, because I want him to get nice and fat. And when he's fat enough, I'm going to, let me see, uh, yeah, braised boy with baked beans. Oh, yeah, that's my favourite. <laughs> it is, you know, it's lovely. Oh, it's lovely. And off she went, <laughs> sniggering and giggling and dribbling at the thought of the meal to come. And so, every day for the next six weeks, Gretel was forced to cook lots of delicious things for her brother while she was given nothing to eat but crab shells. And every morning, the old witch would hobble over to the cage and say, Now nah, then, little Hansel, stick out a finger and let me feel how plump you have become. <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? But Hansel had realised how short-sighted the old witch was. And so every morning, instead of sticking out his finger, he stuck out an old chicken bone. <laughs> That's strange. Don't seem to be able to fatten him up at all. He's just thin as ever. <laughs> and eventually, she could wait no longer. Oh, pfft. <laughs> Get the oven ready, Gretel, she said. There seems to be no way at all of fattening up your brother, so I'll just have to eat him the way he is. But we'll have to make some bread first. He's so thin, I'll have to make him into sandwiches. <laughs> just my luck. Uh, and then she put a horrible, fake, wobbly smile on her face and came limping over to Gretel. Uh, get in the oven, would you, Gretel, my dear? I just want you to tell me if it's hot enough for the bread. <laughs> Well, by now, Gretel knew the witch pretty well, and she guessed that the old woman planned to cook her too. She thought quickly, uh, well, I'd love to get in the oven for you, darling witch, said Gretel cleverly, but I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> the door's too small. Too small? The witch cackled. It's not too small. Uh, yeah, yes, it is. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's oh, blimey, look, I'll show you, I'll do it myself. And the ghastly old woman put her head and shoulders into the oven to prove her point. Well, that was just what Gretel had been waiting for. She drew back her foot and kicked the old woman right into the oven, then slammed the door, clickety-click, threw it away. And that was the end of her. Fantastic. After that, Gretel let her brother out of the cage and after the two of them had fallen into each other's arms, they searched the gingerbread house and found a box full of diamonds and pearls and also an up-to-date map of the wood which showed them how to get out. And soon they arrived safely home. Phew! Their father was overjoyed to see them, for he'd not slept one single night after he'd agreed to abandon them. 
And as for their stepmother, it turned out she had slipped on a banana skin and fallen down the well, and that had been the end of her. Great! Ha Hansel and Gretel showed their father the jewels that they had found, and, well, I don't need to say how the story ends, do I? Happily ever after. Except for the witch <laughs> and the stepmother. But who cares about them? I don't. <laughs> well, are we going somewhere or what? What's happening? <sighs> Chair, man. Well, come on, I can't stand around here all day. Let's go somewhere or let's have some lunch or something. Oh, you're trying to make me feel sick. Oh, how funny. Hello. <laughs> ah. There was once. Well, perhaps there was more than once. Well, this is the only once I know about. Anyway, anyway. There was once a very, very poor miller who had a very, very beautiful daughter. But the miller was... <laughs> the miller was so worried about his problems that he went for a long walk one afternoon and on his walk he happened to bump into the local king. Hello down there. Goodness me, you're common, aren't you? Yes, I am. <laughs> Thank you, Your Holiness. <laughs> well, would you mind lying down in that muddy puddle while I walk over you? I don't want to get my horse's booties dirty. <laughs> no, of course not, Your Honour. <laughs> Splosh! And while they were chatting away, the miller felt very small and unimportant and, and wet, lying there underneath the rich, powerful king. So, to make himself seem more important, the miller said that he had a daughter who could spin straw into gold. <laughs> oh, dear. It's always a mistake to tell lies, especially to kings, and particularly to this king, who was very fond of gold. Oh, really? said the king. Well, if your daughter is so very clever, bring her to me castle in the morning and I'll put her to the test. Well, the miller was very sorry he told such an enormous lie, but there was nothing else for it, and the next day his daughter was brought to the king's castle. The king led her straight away to a room which was full of straw and gave her a spinning wheel. Now set to work, said the king, and if you haven't spun all this straw into gold by tomorrow morning, I'll chop off your head. <laughs> he slammed the door shut and left the girl alone. She sat still for a long time, wondering how she could avoid having her head chopped off. Because, of course, she hadn't the slightest idea how to turn straw into gold. She became more and more frightened, until all she could think of doing was weeping. So she did. <laughs> all at once, the door opened and in stepped a strange little man. Oh, good evening, Mistress Miller, he said. And why do you weep so much? <laughs> Alas, she replied, I must spin this straw into gold and I don't know how to do it. I see. Well, it won't be easy, said the little man. And what will you give me if I spin it for you? <gasps> I'll, 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 give, I'll give you my necklace. But well, that will be something, I suppose. Oh, good, no, shut up. Oh, good, no, 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 stop crying. Will you shut up? Stop that weeping now. I accept the cheap stringy necklace as payment. The little man took the necklace, sat in front of the spinning wheel, and started it up. And so he went on all night long. <laughs> Gold began pouring out. Until all the straw was spun and the room was full of gold. By daybreak, the king was delighted and astonished when he saw the gold, but his heart only became more greedy. One room was full of gold, he said to himself. Why not two rooms full of gold? <laughs> so he had the girl locked in another room, twice the size of the first 
with twice as much straw to be spun into gold, or else... <laughs> Again, the girl had no idea what to do, so she... <laughs> burst into tears the moment the door was locked. But again, the little man appeared and offered to help. But, he added, I can only help if A, you give me some payment for all my trouble, and B, if you stop all that horrid crying. <laughs> nice and noisy, good ho. <laughs> Overhead crankshaft really is a strange genius. <laughs> Come on, action the gold. Let's be having There we go. Cool. Super! Again, the king was delighted, but he still wasn't satisfied. He led the girl to a room a thousand and three miles square, filled with a thousand and three tons of straw. He said, If you can spin all this into gold tonight, I'll make you my wife. But if not, <laughs> it's bye-bye head time for you. Out the way, out the way. Oh, Nick, curse. That was my best dressing gown. Oh, well. When the girl was left alone, the little man appeared for the third time and said, Now, this might be difficult. Oh, yes, indeed, what a difficult amount of straw. What will you give me if I do all this for you? Alas, said the girl, I've nothing left that I can give you. <laughs> well, in that case, he replied, and stop that, that's more than enough weeping for one lifetime. In that case, if you do become queen, you must give me your firstborn child. <laughs> well, who can tell if that will ever happen? The miller's daughter thought to herself, and she agreed to the little man's request. And when morning came, the king found a thousand and three tons of gold in the thousand and three square mile room. So, he married the miller's daughter straight away and made her his queen. Well now, after a year of marriage, the queen had forgotten all about the little spinning man until she gave birth to a beautiful child. Immediately, the little man appeared in her room and demanded that she keep her promise. The frightened queen offered him all the riches of her kingdom if he would leave her the child, but he shook his head. No, no, no! Something alive is much dearer to me than all the treasures of the world! <laughs> well, the queen began to weep and groan so much, Oh, no! Oh, please, oh, please! That the little man said, All right, all right, all right! Listen! I will let you keep your child if in three days' time you can guess what my name is. Uh, well, is your name Elizabeth, the Queen said. No, no. Uh, <laughs> Lizzie. No. <laughs> Balthazar. <laughs> Sid. <laughs> Rosie. <laughs> Myrtle. The Queen went through all the names she knew, but each time the little man danced about, shaking his head and shouting, that's not my name. <laughs> On the second day, the Queen sent a messenger through all the country, far and wide, to collect new and unusual names. She tried them all on the little man. Perhaps your name is uh, Rotting Radishes, uh, or Donkey Breath, uh, no, Cinderella. Oh, no, that's a different story. Uh, but at every name, he cried out, that's not my name. <laughs> on the third day, the Queen had sent her messenger even further and wider, looking for names. But now it was getting very late. Almost time for the little man to come for the last time, and still the messenger had not returned. <sighs> the Queen sighed and watched the window. She worried and her blood ran cold as she saw the sun begin to go down. But then, at last, the messenger came home. Did he have any names? <laughs> I'm not sure, he said. But as I searched, I came to a high mountain near the edge of a forest where foxes and hares say good night to each other. <sighs> May I? And in this place, I saw a little house. By its front door, a fire was burning. And round this fire, a really ridiculous little man was dancing on one leg and shouting, Today I stew, and then I'll bake. Tomorrow I shall the Queen's child take. Oh, how glad I am that nobody knows that my name is Rumpelstiltskin. Well, you can imagine how pleased the Queen was when she heard the name. But what a stupid song. Anyway, only minutes after she had found out, the little man came in and asked, Now, Mistress Queen, what is my name? The Queen thought for a moment and said, uh, Is it Barry? No, that's not my name. <laughs> is it uh, Kevin? <laughs> Close. Right, last chance. Well, perhaps your name is Rumpelstiltskin. <sighs> 
The devil has told you that! The devil has told you! Shrieked the little man, and he stamped his left foot so hard on the ground that he couldn't pull it off again. Then, in a blood-boiling rage, he took hold of his left leg with both his hands and pulled away so hard that he tore himself in two. And that was the end of him. <laughs> well, Rumpelstiltskin would never bother her again. <laughs> but the Queen had one more name to think of. A name for her beautiful baby, who was now safe and hers forever. And she was so relieved that she had saved her baby, she named it Phew! <laughs> Serves you right for being nasty. <laughs> right. There was once a prince called Stefan who, unknown to his father, had just become engaged to a fantastically beautiful princess called Finella, whom he loved very much. But then, one day, just as they were in the middle of a really fantastic kiss, Stefan received a message that his father was dying. And he had to hurry home. Stefan turned to his beloved Finella and said, I must go now and leave you, but I am giving you this ring to remember me by. Don't worry. When I am king, I will return and marry you. <sighs> so, Prince Stefan went home, and his father said, Ah, dear Stefan, I'd like you to get married. Oh, 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 good, said Stefan. Yeah, I'd like you to marry Princess Ethelberger, daughter of Mad King Ralph. <laughs> Oh, oh dear, said Stefan. But he had to agree, because when someone's dying, it's kindest to do as they ask. Oh, oh, oh yes, Father, of course, if you say so, <laughs> said Stefan. Good lad, said the king. <laughs> and with that, he died. So, Stefan became king and wrote to Princess Ethelberger asking her to marry him. And she agreed. The Princess Ethelberger, however, had no real wish to get married at all. She was a clever girl and would rather have spent the rest of her life with a good book. But mad King Ralph insisted she married Stefan. Yeah! You better do as I say, or I shall eat your pet hedgehog, he said, and carried on with his cuckoo impression. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, you gotta say it's good because I'm the king. A bloody bloody blah. So Ethelberger had no choice in the matter and obediently wrote back to Stefan saying, Yes, I will be with you as fast as I can finish the encyclopedia I am reading at the moment. Probably in about uh, yeah, six months. Love F. Finella, meanwhile, had been missing Stefan so badly that she'd made herself ill. And when the news arrived that he was to marry someone else, she nearly died of heartbreak. But instead of being all wet and whingy and dripping around the place, filling the castle with tears, she resolved, well, if I can't marry him, I can at least be near him if I'm clever. And she hit upon a plan, and this was it. She searched throughout the kingdom until she found 11 girls who looked exactly like herself. Then, all 12 of them disguised themselves as huntsmen. And they rode off to the court of King Stefan. Clippity-clop, 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 clippity-clop. Come along, girls. Clippity-clop, clippity-clop, clippity-clop. And when they arrived, ah, here we are. Good. Funella put on a false moustache and asked in a gruff butch voice if, uh, if the king needed any huntsmen to work for him. Hmm? Well, King Stefan looked at her and didn't recognise her. Hmm. But as a king can never have too many huntsmen, he said, yes, I will happily take you into my service and I will call you uh, the king's 12 huntsmen. So the plan succeeded and Fenella could be near Stefan every day. And although she went all blushy and giggly and her moustache fell off every time he came in the room, she was as happy as a trifle in a tummy. But, unfortunately, King Stefan had a pet lion, 
which was a wonderfully clever animal because he knew all secret things and could see all the things that people wanted to hide. And one evening, the lion said to the king, uh, listen, Steve, <laughs> I suppose you think you've got 12 huntsmen working for you, hmm? <laughs> well, no, you're very much mistaken. They are 12 girls. <laughs> that can't be true, said the king. How can you prove they're girls? <laughs> oh, easy, answered the lion. Just get one of the servants to throw some dried peas all over the floor and then you'll soon see. Men have a strong, firm tread and when they walk over dried peas, they don't skid and make the peas roll all over the place. But girls trip and slip and the peas roll everywhere. Well, the king thought this was very good advice. <laughs> so he ordered the peas to be thrown on the floor. But luckily, the servant, who'd been told to throw the peas, was very friendly with the twelve huntsmen. And when he heard that the peas were for a test, he went to his friends and told them everything. And he laughed and he said, <laughs> that lion's really gone mad this time. He wants to make the king believe that you are girls. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever next. <laughs> I don't know, it just tickles me. <laughs> and off he went, laughing until the stars came out. But the girls, disguised as huntsmen, panicked and said, Oh, what are we to do? Every time we've walked over peas, we've always slipped over. <laughs> now, don't be so girlish and foolish, said Finella. We're far cleverer than a lion and a king. All we need to do is take some dried peas from the kitchen and practice walking with men's big, clumsy footsteps. So they practiced walking on peas all night until their feet were sore. And the next morning, they stepped so firmly on them and so confidently that none of them slipped, and not one of the peas rolled an inch. The king said to the lion, you, you have lied to me. They walk just like men. Yes, well, they were warned that they were going to be put to the test, and they pretended to be strong, said the lion, because he knew everyone's secrets. Just let 12 beautiful ball gowns of silver lace be brought into the room, and they will run over to them and try them on. And as you well know, Steve, no man would do that. Well, the king liked this advice too, and he had the silver lace ball gowns spread out along one side of a room. But the servant, who'd been asked to spread out the dresses, was again the huntsman's friend. So he went to them and told them everything. Imagine this. <laughs> the lion now thinks that you will see some silver ball gowns and want to try them on. <laughs> Brave, strong huntsman like you. <laughs> the very idea. <laughs> He'll be the death of me, that lion. <laughs> Oh dear! Oh, don't start me off! Oh, oh I've got to go! <laughs> and he went away, laughing until the bats and the owls came out. But when the friendly servant had gone, Finella said to her eleven girls, Now, keep control of yourselves. I know you've had to wear men's boring clothes for a long time now, but you mustn't even look twice at these dresses. Personally, I'd just die to try on a silver ball gown right now, but we must be strong. Well, the king had his twelve huntsmen summoned the next morning, and they went through the room and never looked twice at the Borgans. Hmm. In fact, they behaved as though they hadn't even noticed them. The king turned angrily to the lion and said, You have lied to me again. They are men. They are not interested in dresses at all. Get out of my sight. I won't have liars in my court. You're just trying to stir up trouble because you had all the attention before the huntsman arrived. Yeah, well, you can go out and live in the garden in the pouring rain with the dogs and the sheep and the ordinary dumb animals. No more silk pajamas and cushion by the fire for you. And stop calling me Steve. Don't even speak to me at all. Very well, said the lion. And he went out into the cold rain. Well, King Stefan grew even more fond of his twelve huntsmen. Now he had no lion to talk to. And whenever he went hunting, they all went with him. But one day, when they were out hunting, news came that Ethelberga had finally finished reading the encyclopedia and had arrived at King Stefan's palace ready to marry him. <sighs> but when Finella heard this, her heart almost burst and she fainted dead away and fell off her horse. Stefan rushed over and pulled off her big hot huntsman's gloves to cool her down. And there, on the huntsman's hand, the king saw the ring which he had given to Finella. And when he looked more closely at the huntsman's face, he recognised that this indeed was Finella. Well, his heart was so overjoyed, he kissed her. And as she opened her eyes, he said, 
You are mine. I, I am yours. And no one in the world can change that. And where did you get that dreadful moustache? Well, the king sent a messenger to Ethelberga and asked her to return to her own kingdom because he had a wife already. Ethelberga was delighted and hurried home to her books, most of which by now Mad King Ralph had eaten. Immediately, King Stefan and Finella were married. The eleven girls threw on the silver lace ball gowns with gusto and wore them to the celebrations. The king apologised to the lion and brought him back into his cushion by the fire. Because after all, the lion had told the truth. And, uh, can I call you Steve again? said the lion. Of course you can, said the king. Call me what you like. So the lion called him Gordon because he thought it was a much nicer name. celebrity around here. You're just nothing but a worthless, stupid chair that's good for nothing except putting your bottom on. This is the last... Oh, hello, children. It's nice Uncle Ricky. <laughs> hello. I know what you're thinking. Ooh, it's Rick. I hope he tells me a story that's got lots of porridge in it. Well, you're in luck. And here goes with the most porridgey story in history. Once upon a time, there was an enormous purple frog called Horace with nine legs and the IQ of a nuclear physicist. It was Horace's ambition to be the first frog on the moon. And the second, and the third. In fact, he wanted to be all of the first 500 frogs on the moon. But unfortunately, a war fell on him and he died. The end. <laughs> 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 story really was it oh here's a good porridgey one many 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 years ago there was a poor but unusually good little girl who lived with her mother on the edge of a forest the mother was very poor and they never had much to eat and one day they ran out altogether there was nothing in the larder not a crust of bread not a grain of porridge nothing the mother didn't know what to do. She was a simple woman, not terribly bright, but she was also kind-hearted, and although she didn't mind going hungry herself, she couldn't bear to see her daughter going without. Well, never mind, mother, the little girl said. I can manage without breakfast, and lunch, and dinner, and breakfast again. <laughs> I'll just go for a walk in the woods. You never know. Maybe something will turn up. So the little girl went off for a walk in the woods, and soon she found herself far away from the cottage where she lived. <laughs> she thought she knew the forest well, but this part of it was all strange and unworldly. The grass was silver, not green, and covered with a glittering carpet of dew. Silver cobwebs hung from the trees. Even the flowers and the animals looked as if they were made of silver. <laughs> and just as she was beginning to wonder if she wasn't completely lost, the little girl met an old woman with silver hair, carrying a small silver pot under one arm. 
as if this wasn't strange enough. The old woman seemed to know who she was and what her problem was without even being told. Take this silver pot, my dear, the old woman said. It will help you out of your difficulties. Oh, but I, I have nothing to put in the pot, <laughs> the little girl said. Ah, you need nothing, the old woman replied. Just follow these simple instructions. All you do is say, cook, little pot, cook. And the pot will cook hot, sweet porridge. And when you want it to stop, you say, stop, little pot, stop. It's as simple as that. Cook, little pot, cook, and stop, little pot, stop. The girl repeated the words carefully. Yeah, that's right, baby, the old lady said. That's exactly it. And it really was that simple. The girl took the pot home, stood over it and said, <clears throat> Cook, little pot, cook. And at once, the pot began to make porridge, hot and smooth with, with thick brown sugar and cream. Oh, sometimes it, it seemed to taste of bananas and, and other times of coconut or toasted marshmallows with chocolate sauce. Mm. And when she and her mother had eaten enough, she said, Stop, little pot, stop. And the pot cooked no more. All went well. The mother and the child were never hungry. <laughs> In fact, both of them put on quite a lot of weight. Three times a day they ate porridge. Breakfast, lunch and tea. Mm, and it always tasted of so many wonderful things and was so delicious that they never grew tired of it. But things went suddenly wrong one day when the little girl was out visiting her grandmother with her best red cape on. The mother had just eaten a big bowl of porridge, which had, which had tasted of raspberry milkshake, but she fancied a bit more. And for the very first time, she decided that she would be the one who would get the pot cooking. Right, <clears throat> cook, little pot, cook, she said. And at once, the pot got cooking. <laughs> well, <laughs> the mother was delighted. <laughs> I did that. <laughs> but just when she got a nice big bowl full, she realised that she'd forgotten the words to make it stop. Oh, cease, little pot, cease, she tried. And no more, little pot, uh, no more. Uh, that's enough, potty, enough. By now, the porridge was pouring over the edge of the pot and slopping about on the kitchen floor. Uh, thanks, little pot, yeah, thanks, <laughs> the mother tried. It was no good. More porridge bubbled over the edge of the pot and slurped down onto the floor. And that wasn't the end of it. Gradually at first, but then faster and faster, the porridge poured out. Soon it was climbing up the walls, up the staircase, into the bedrooms. It was only a small cottage, and in what seemed like minutes, and probably was, both the bedrooms were absolutely jammed full of porridge, which was even messier than if they'd been porridged full of jam. Now it was pressing against the windows. The walls were bending and buckling. Something had to give. And with a great <laughs> explosion, the windows shot out of their frames and a great waterfall of porridge cascaded out and into the garden below. Help, little pot! Uh, no, little pot! Oh, stop it, you rotten pot! Uh, that's enough, you ruddy pot! But nothing worked. Grey, steaming porridge thundered down the garden path. One after the other, the flower beds bloop, bloop, disappeared. <laughs> and not just the flower beds. The very trees themselves, <coughs> they were torn down by the flood of porridge. Soon the garden was gone and the porridge had only just begun. It was the neighbour's turn next. He was an elderly man who kept himself to himself. He'd been sitting in a deck chair reading a newspaper <laughs> when he was disturbed by the mother's shouts. No, little pot! Oh, whoa, little pot! What? Uh, what's that? A pot? Hmm? The neighbour mumbled to himself, and a second later, <laughs> the porridge got him. <laughs> a great wave of it crashed down, sending him one way and his wig another. Then it made for his house. <laughs> the house didn't last long. Soon it had vanished beneath a churning sea of porridge. And now it was the turn of the village. It had been a quiet day. Nothing much had happened in the village. A couple of old men were sitting in the village square. Ah, I say, old chap. Ah, yes, old chap. What's that, then? Oh, well, there would seem to be, um... Ah, it's just a tidal wave of porridge. What? A tidal wave of porridge? <gasps> and that was as far as they got. 
<laughs> the porridge roared in. <laughs> and instead of the village eating porridge, the porridge ate the village. The town hall, the post office, Sainsbury's, and soon the surrounding mountains themselves were sinking into a great steaming porridgey lake. By the time the girl got home, her mother was on the roof, panicking and eating wildly. Mother, what's going on? I've had to swim home. Yeah, well, never mind about that. Do something. I've been treading porridge for an hour. By now, the mother was close to hysterics. Do something! The little girl suddenly realised what had happened and quickly uttered the magic words that her poor mother had been unable to remember. Stop, little pot, stop! The pot at last stopped cooking and that was the end of it but for the next six months six months anyone who traveled anywhere had to eat their way across the countryside and they had to be very fond of porridge yeah I don't think you'll ever hear a story with much more porridge in it than that There were once three really big-headed doctors who lived in a small town and who were utterly convinced that they were the best and cleverest doctors in the whole world. And that was the trouble, you see. Everybody for miles around had heard the three doctors boasting. There simply weren't enough people left to boast too about how wonderful they were. So one day, they decided to travel around the world to find fresh people to show off to. Well. For several months, they travelled across the country, telling everyone they met how clever they were, until one evening, they arrived at an inn. The innkeeper and his wife were busy doing the sort of thing that innkeepers and their wives are best at doing. And when the three doctors arrived, they walked straight in with their chests puffed out, knocked the innkeeper's wife out of the way, and kicked the cat! Meow! Uh, your best food and your best beer, they exclaimed, and make sure you serve it on your best silver plates for the best doctors in the world have just arrived. Blimey, you three gentlemen think pretty highly of yourselves, don't you? said the landlord. Yes, we do, you horrid, fat, smelly peasant. That's because we're infinitely more clever, talented and attractive than anyone else in the universe, aren't we, guys? Yeah, we are, so there. Now get us some food, hamster brain. All right then, said the innkeeper. No, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Just, just one minute. If you think you're so great, let's see what you can do. So, the three doctors put their heads together and had a quick chat. And he goes, well, I got the tomato, I've 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 got the tomato. And they came up with three quite disgusting ideas. You want to know how clever I am? asked the first doctor. Yeah, well, this is what I'll do. I'll cut off my own hand right in front of you now. Yeah, and in the morning I'll stick it back on again. <laughs> you think that's clever? exclaimed the second doctor. Single hand, blimey. I'll do something much more clever than that. I'll cut out my own heart and stick that back in in the morning. Yeah, that's what I'll do. A hand! <laughs> a heart! <laughs> sneered the third doctor. I used to do that when I was a teenager. I'll take out my eyes. Yeah, both of my eyes. And I'll put them back in in the morning. Crikey, well, if you can do that, the innkeeper said, I'll give you your bed and your breakfast for nothing. Now, what the innkeeper didn't know is that the three boastful doctors had a special ointment. Yeah, this was a, this was a magic ointment, which had been given to them by a grateful witch after they'd managed to get rid of her warts. She had 200 warts on her nose. But that wasn't the problem. Her nose was growing out of her chin. That was the problem. It was a simple operation. They just cut off her head. No, 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 but that's another story. Anyway, the point is, this ointment would stick them back together again, just like that. Just like that. Just like that. So they didn't care what they did and quickly agreed to the innkeeper's challenge. The first doctor hunted around in his overstuffed tool bag, brought out a knife and going, da, 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 cut off his hand. Oh, look, everybody, look what I just did. <laughs> The second doctor, meanwhile, opened up his chest of goodies, found the right compartment and... Cut out his heart! 
The third doctor, without any further ado, pulled out a teaspoon and... plucked out his eyes. Ugh. Well, after this utterly disgusting performance, the three doctors all went to bed. The innkeeper put the hand, the heart and the eyes on a plate, put the plate away in the fridge and turned in himself. But unfortunately, his wife forgot to close the fridge door. And that night, their pet cat got in, took one look at the plate and with a great meow at the lot. Nobody found out about this until the next morning when the innkeeper and his wife went to open the fridge. They uh, opened it, they looked inside. <gasps> An empty plate. They looked again. Oh dear, oh dear, the wife moaned. What am I to do? The hand and the art and the eyes are all gone into the cat and the cat's gone off too. Well, we'll just have to replace them, the innkeeper said. We'll just have to find another hand, another art and two more eyes before they wake up. But where will we find them, the wife wailed. Look, just calm down, my love, the innkeeper replied. Let's take this one at a time. Right, the, the hand. How about a second hand shop? The art. We could go to an art gallery. And the eyes in the box. What box? The eyes box in the fridge. Oh, that's a good idea. It's, no, it's not. Just shut up. Well, give me a moment to think. I know. And in the end, they got the hand from a convicted criminal who had been hanged on the local gallows. Then they went down to the larder and took out a pig's heart that they had been saving for soup. Ugh. And finally, they caught the cat that had caused all the trouble and took out its eyes. Now, simmer down. I'm just going to take out your eyes. Come on, it's only a story. And, uh, and took out its eyes. <laughs> so, when the three doctors woke up and came downstairs, there was a hand, a heart and two eyes, just like the ones they'd left. All right, they said, stand back, stand back, all you stupid, ordinary people, and watch out you don't die of amazement, because you're about to see some totally, amazingly, incredibly, fantastically spectacular doxering. <laughs> and out came the ointment, and they smeared it all over them, just like a tube of glue. So, the first doctor stuck on the thief's hand. The second doctor opened himself up and squashed the pig's heart into his chest. And the third doctor, well, he felt around for a bit, found the cat's eyes and, assuming they were his own, popped them into his head. And the innkeeper and his wife clapped loudly. <laughs> Not only because they'd never seen surgery performed as skillfully as this, but also, of course, because they hadn't been caught out. You win the bet, he said. <laughs> You're certainly as clever as you said you were. Cleverer, in fact. <laughs> so you can have your bed and breakfast for nothing. And let's hope we never see you again, the wife whispered under her breath. Then everybody bowed at each other and said their goodbyes, and off the three doctors went. But it soon became very clear that something had gone horribly wrong. They'd only been walking for about five minutes and had been talking about how clever they were, you know, which was their favourite subject of conversation, as we know, when they came upon a huge muddy puddle in the road. Well, two of the doctors tried to step round it without getting their shoes dirty, but the other doctor, the one with the pig's heart, leapt in the air, landed on his bottom, slapped bang in the middle of the puddle, and proceeded to roll about on his back with his legs in the air. <laughs> what are you doing? The other doctors exclaimed. Have you lost your mind? <laughs> the doctor replied. What did he say? I think he said... <laughs> what did he say that for? I don't know. What did he say that for? <laughs> what did he say? He said... <laughs> What did he say that for? I don't know. What did he say that for? He said, what did he say that for? I don't know. What did he say that for? He said, what did he say that for? I don't know. He's... And they went on like this for 20 minutes until the other two got fed up and dragged him out of the puddle and continued on their way. But they hadn't been going another five minutes when the second doctor, the one with the cat's eyes, stopped dead. His hair stood on end and out came his tongue, licking his lips. Look at that mouse on that hill 20 miles away, he exclaimed. Have you ever seen such a plump little mouse? Meow! What did he say? He said meow. What did he say that for? I don't know. What did you say that for? Meow! What did he say? He said meow. What did he say that for? He said, oh, don't start that again. <laughs> and you shut up. And it was only by saying, hey, let's all go that way and buy some cream at the first shop, that they managed to continue on their journey. Another five minutes passed. And this time, the three doctors happened to meet a rich merchant who was travelling the other way. Just as he passed by, nodding politely as travellers in those days did, the third doctor's hand shot out and disappeared into the merchant's baggy and richly patterned coat. It seemed to have a life of its own. 
and when it reappeared a few moments later, it was holding ten golden coins. The merchant hadn't felt a thing. It had been a perfect piece of pickpocketing. But the other two doctors had seen everything. My dear friend, they exclaimed, what has got into you? Don't you know it's wrong to steal? Uh, steal what? The third doctor asked, as his hand slipped the coins neatly up his sleeve. Well, with the one doctor throwing himself into every puddle, another trying to eat mice, and the third robbing everyone he met, it didn't take them much time to work out they'd be made to look like utter fools. Uh, I, I, I think we'd better go home as quickly as possible, they said, their faces as red as a monkey's bum. Eventually, they arrived back in their hometown, very, very embarrassed. So much so that none of them ever operated again. And they never boasted again either. But the funny thing is that they found they were actually much happier than they had been to start with. And that must be the moral of the story. For although the first doctor still enjoyed an occasional role in a really wet, muddy puddle, and although the second doctor was occasionally spotted chasing mice, and although it was well known that the third doctor had a tendency to steal other people's silver, on the whole, everybody thought their travels had greatly improved them, and they spent the rest of their days being liked, not for being clever, but just for being themselves. <laughs>